was very difficult actually to choose 10 people from the number of people who actually supported this organization in various ways or in a forefront of fighting for secularism and free expression. Um, there are so many people and it's really difficult to choose 10 people who have decided at the end um, who they should be for this year. Um, I'm going to hand over to Mariam to announce the first uh, winner of uh, Council of Ex Muslim 10th Anniversary 2017 Award. Here we go. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, first of all, we want to say that we've got some beautiful awards, and they are the work of the brilliant Sudabe Gashta Sebi. Can you stand up, Sudabe? <laughs> She's made 10 for us, and she gave us an extra one so we can have in the office. And uh, it's uh, one represents each year of the CMB. And of course, when you look, you know, it, this was a really hard thing to do, because honestly, if you look around this room, practically all of you, maybe all of you, practically all of you really deserve to get an award. But unfortunately, we've only been around for 10 years. so. The next 10, you, you'll be getting yours next. <coughs> so <coughs> we want to give it to, we, it was hard, let, let's be honest, but there's some people that we just have to give the award to. And the first person we'd like to give the award to is our own, very own, our lovely, our wonderful Bona Ahmad. Where is she? And, and we want to give it to <coughs> and we want to give it to Bona because she is really the spirit of resistance and resilience, not just for free thinkers in Bangladesh, for, but for all of us. We love you, Bona. Okay, uh, I think I had too many glasses of champagne, so I might say some truth right now. Um, it will not be a scripted political talk. So I have been thinking about these two days. It has been a brilliant two days. I don't know how you pulled it off. It, 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 it's just brilliant. Um, one thing I have been thinking about is if these two days have told us anything other than the unity and the resistance is that the, the common narrative that we have about atheists, right? We are some kind of like uh, creatures descended from hell, uh, sons, like sons of the devil uh, with no morality, no ethics. Um, and we are like one homogeneous like creature, but look at this like two days we, we showed that we are very diverse. We agree. We don't we don't agree. We have different values. Our world values are so different. Uh, we debate, but we don't kill, we don't chop off thumbs, we don't, like, we don't stab people on head. I have four of them, six to seven inches of them. And we don't kill. So, you know, if we offend you, suck it up. <laughs> Just as an end note, I'll tell you a story. Like, as much as I do, I'm not angry at the religious people, as much as I talked about all the, you know, political unity and, um, you know, all that love for the religious people and all that, I have been an atheist since the age of 12. I was actually asking Anthony, and his story is so much similar to mine. I went to my dad at the age of 12 and I'm like, how come every religion says they are right? So what if I was born in the wrong religion and I would be practicing it and, going, and, and I would still go to hell? And my dad goes, 
why don't you go read the scriptures? So I went away at the 12, age, age of 12. You can imagine how much like my brain was halfway formed by then, or three-fourths of the way. And then I go, I, I came back to my dad a year later. I'm like, Dad, they all sound like fairy tales. How do you believe in these things? And my dad goes, okay, if that's what you want to believe. And that was the end of discussion, you know, about religion in my family. So I have been lucky, and of course not lucky. You know, two years ago, I, I kind of found out that I'm not that lucky. But thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm glad that I could share my story with all of you. And um, there is such a big community of us. It just, it just feels great. Thank you. The second person that we want to uh, give the award to is someone who's not here. There's two people. Uh, they're not here. One has been sentenced to 10 years in prison and a thousand lashes. And his wife, that's Raif Badawi, and his wife, Ensof Haydar, has been an unrelenting campaigner on behalf of Raif, but all political prisoners in Saudi Arabia, and for freedom of expression and conscience. And they have become heroes for all of us. They do represent uh, the resistance in a way that many, many don't. In a, you know, they're one of the greatest examples of it. And Sof was very happy to win the award. We actually want to give it to both of them because I think we often hear Raif winning lots of prizes, but honestly, I think Ensof deserves it just as much. Uh, and... and uh, <laughs> And uh, Ensof has asked uh, Jamila Ben Habib to take the award on their behalf. Where are you, Jamila? Come on, Jamila. Thanks. Um, just a few words to say. Uh, when I uh, think about uh, Raif and uh, what he uh, uh, wrote and when he said in uh, a very worst, worst country uh, as uh, Saudi Arabia, I just get the courage to continue the crucial uh, battle, struggle against the political Islam. And just say to myself, if uh, a person as Raif could say what he said in the worst country, so we should say more and more and a lot of more than him in the democratic country. So, <laughs> please, uh, please, uh, uh, write and uh, say and uh, create and resist and uh, together against the Islamism fascism. Okay, the next award goes to a woman you've met at this conference who got a standing ovation. You now know who I'm talking about. And uh, she's uh, someone who really represents uh, the spirit of resistance against all odds as well. Zainab al Razui, she is someone who, we heard her speak.
I'm really so proud, and I have to say thank you. Thank you for all of you for having understood that this struggle is not a detail in history. It is exactly what draws the boundary between civilization and barbarianism. For us, it is a question of dignity or of death or life. So please continue the struggle. Being among you, being with all of you, have given me a lot of courage, a lot of hope. And believe me, I will do my best. And I'm sure that all of you will do your best every day to win that struggle because we can't lose it. It's impossible. It's, I mean, it's a, really a question of, of, of the continuity of the civilization. We can't lose that battle. And we know that we are definitely right. And we cannot just uh, capitulate with that uh, fascism. So I'm very proud to having met all of those very inspiring people. And I hope that we will keep meeting and that we will keep doing things. And believe me, I will do my best to continue to deserve that prize every day. Thank you. Well done. Congratulations. The next woman is a woman who has uh, put her great skills and her art into defending us. Uh, she made a film about us, a film that was shown on ITV, for goodness sakes. Uh, brought us into the mainstream, and in a sense, a lot of the support we got around this conference was because of the heightened visibility. Dia got a lot of shit for defending us, for doing a film about us. Oh, why are you doing a film about ex-Muslims, those troublemakers? And uh, she's a Muslim herself, and yet she stood with us, and she made this most wonderful film. So we do want to honor her as well. <coughs> I know. <coughs> and <coughs> Dia is busy making her other film now, causing trouble somewhere else. And she's asked for Sadia Hamid to accept the award on her behalf. Thank you. Can I uh, put it down for a moment, actually? So I want to start off by thanking you all on Dia's behalf, which I'm sure she would be doing now anyway. But before I do say anything, I was wondering if I could get my lovely sisterhood sisters up here with me, so I'm not stood here by myself, because I could really do with you here right now. So Halima, Zaina, Media, Mizan, come on up. <laughs> and you, and you. <laughs> <laughs> It's really cringy. I have written a speech, uh, and I'm really sorry if it gets long or uncomfortable. Um, and everybody's had such a lovely time, so I hate to put a dampener on things. But this is probably the first time I've been in a safe enough space to talk about, um, just to talk about this, really. Um, is it? Can you hear me? Can, can you just say if you can't hear me? Because I will, yeah, anyway. So I just wanted to thank Dia to start off with, which I've already done. Um, but I could never thank her enough. I could never, ever thank her enough for what she did. After the film was released, um, I gave some interviews. And I was always asked about why, I, why this film was made. Um, but I always found it very hard to talk about why, because I was suffering with crushing and destructive grief. I became involved in the film uh, to begin with, with for one reason and one person alone, and that was my brother. He 
He was my best friend. On the morning of the 20th of September, 2015, I got a call telling me that my brother had taken his life. So I rushed straight home and went straight to his room because I knew he wouldn't leave me without telling me why. And I knew there was going to be a letter somewhere. So whilst I was frantically looking through my stuff, my brother's stuff, my little brother, my other brother, he walked into the room and he hands me two letters, one for me and one for my family. My brother, my brother had, had apologized for ending his life and told me to carry on fighting. Even when he was killing himself, he, he carried on apologizing. And I hear it every single day from ex-Muslims that are continuously apologizing for being who they are. Their parents never apologize for the mess they're leaving their kids' lives in. The kids apologize again and again. He was the most caring, loving, and kind person. Everyone fell in love with him instantly. Everybody wanted to be his friend. So that night, I led awake in bed, recalling the countless conversations I had with my brother, because we both talked about life and death so much. We both wanted to be cremated. And I knew I had, to, I had to bring this up in the morning with my family. So I woke up and I waited for my mum and dad to come down. And I told my dad that my brother wants to be cremated. I know that. My dad then said to me, he told me this. That was all ignored. By Tuesday morning, I had been broken down. Every single family member had bullied me continuously. By Tuesday morning, I had no fight left inside me. On September the, 25th, uh, the 23rd, 2015, Wednesday morning, my brother was buried in the full Islamic way, in a full Muslim burial. And that still hurts so much. They recited Quranic verses, knowing he was an atheist, a proud and out atheist at that. Whilst me and his friends, the few friends that did come to the mosque, were going crazy knowing that our best friend hated this. They made him feel stupid when he was alive for his thoughts and beliefs, and they continued to offend him when he died. They persecute us when we're alive they cut us until we die, they execute us, and then they denigrate us. Just because of the way we choose to live, they erase everything about us. They choose the way we live, and they choose the way we die. So, Dia's documentary was important because ex-Muslims, atheists, free thinkers, we've all been persecuted throughout history in all periods. 
We were nameless and faceless and voiceless. Dia gave us a voice. She gave us a face. She made us human again. She not only shed light on the, the grief and the troubles of the living, but also memorialized those that were killed and taken from us far too soon. And for that, I can't thank her enough. Sorry. <laughs> Well done, Libby. Sorry, we cry a lot. <laughs> okay, right, okay. Okay, I want to do that. No, 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 hold on. Okay. Right, um, it's difficult, isn't it now? Um, our next um, recipient of the award is AC Grayling. AC Grayling is one of, has been one of the <laughs> AC Grayling has been one of the earliest supporter of the campaign um, of Council of Ex-Muslim of Britain. His article in the Guardian when the manifesto was published, I still remember it ten years ago. Actually, he was the first one who publicly acknowledge and put the manifesto in the Guardian and everybody, for everybody to see. I still remember every word you, you wrote in that article, uh, Anthony. So, um, well deserved, and thank you for all your support. Thank you. Um, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. I mean, I feel pretty unusual among these recipients as being the only one who doesn't really deserve it, <laughs> but I'm incredibly honored to, to be given it. Uh, I feel a huge diffidence about it because there are so many people in this room and we've just seen um, people who, unlike myself, who lives in a safe country and I can do these things and write these things without any fear at all, but, but people who do, who, who do live their, their choice, their principles, their commitment with such extraordinary courage. And, um, and I, really, I dedicate uh, this to them rather than to me, although I'm going to keep it because it's very nice. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Well done. <coughs> the next award goes to two women um, from one organization who've been incredibly supportive of us throughout the years. Uh, it's, of course, you, you will know it's uh, Gita Sahgal and Yasmin Rehman. Good thing crying is allowed, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know what to say because I have never faced what so many of you face every day. I'm a product of somebody whose family fought for freedom and who therefore grew up in freedom, and that included the freedom not to believe. It was as natural as breathing. But 
But my beloved friend Yasmin is a believer, a Muslim believer. She's somebody who defends secularism. She says, I'm a feminist and a Muslim. I'm not an Islamic feminist. Her religion is her private business. Her feminism is her activism and her public business. And she's criticized the text and says, we have to look at the problems within the text. She's taken a lot of brave positions. I wish we, she was beside me just now. But this movement has taught us. Pragna sitting here, Pragna Patel, I've worked with her. I don't know how long Pragna, <laughs> over 30 years, I think. <laughs> Many years, we stood together, we organized the march against, not the march, we stood in one place on Parliament Square when the anti rushdi demonstrations were going past. There was something like 20,000 Muslim men calling for Rushdi's death. And we shouted, or Pragna shouted, Salman Rushdi Zindabad, it means long live Salman Rushdi. And we shouted slogans about the right to, we said, your weapon is fear, our weapon is courage, and so on. But there were 40 of us then, and many of those women have not continued on the journey with us. You know, they, they, they now believe that it's the Islamists that are the ones who are facing Islamophobia and so on. But some of us are still here. And when I went with CEMB on the Pride March and marched with these wonderful women who reclaimed their bodies, so there was a feminist part. I think gay pride has sometimes been a little bit of a boys' event. Um, but you know, there we were together with pride veterans, with people who've been their ages, with, with people who uh, had never been there. I was there with a young person who, who actually I was present at their birth, who held up a banner saying justice for Khulhas, the Bangladeshi blogger who was killed and for the right to love. And that march, we must never forget, with all the political fights we're having with pride, that march was an affirmation of CEMB and of the right to apostasy and blasphemy. It was an absolute affirmation from the thousands of people who lined the march. You know, when, in 1989, there were 40 women facing a wave of hate. And when we marched this time, there were thousands of Londoners. Some of them cheered anything that moved, all the corporate banners and all of that. But you could see that they were getting the message. The Chechens who were there, the East Asians who were there, the Africans who were there the Brits who were there, the kids who'd come out to support their lesbian best friend or, you know, something else. The solidarity was there. So let us never forget that the solidarity is there, even when we're having battles around the organization and so on. The solidarity is there. The love is there. And we are here. Sorry guys, this is taking really long and we're loving it. <laughs> it's so much fun. <laughs> okay, our next uh, uh, award goes to this wonderful woman who is, uh, I know everybody says I'm every, the ex-Muslim's mom, but she's like my mom, so I don't know. Uh, she's uh, someone who I, I look up to, who inspires me, who has uh, always challenged me, gets on my nerves a whole lot. We always try, we almost, you know, we're always arguing and fighting. Um, and it's someone, unfortunately, I think a lot of people don't know, though she should really be a household name. Unfortunately, she didn't join us because she's very ill and in hospital. Um, but it is uh, Maria Mahela Lucas. She is something else. And I'm gonna ask Pragna Patel to accept her award. Thank you, Pragna. <coughs> Mariam, you've just sprung this on me. <laughs> and I have to say something about our wonderful hero, Mariam A. Lucas, L.A. Lucas. 
I'll accept this award on her behalf. I'm honored to accept it on her behalf. She really is a hero for many of us. I certainly have looked up to her as I've um, carried on on my political journey. It's a journey that never ends. And people you meet along the way, like people I've met over the weekend here, are people who are, inspire you, who encourage you, and who affirm your struggle. And it just makes you want to wake up the next day, making sure you never submit. And so... <laughs> Maria May Hale Lucas never submits. And one of the things she taught me a long time ago, and I've used that mantra and repeated that mantra endlessly, secularism is a feminist issue. So Maria May, wherever you are, I hope you get better. We need you. This movement, this wonderful rainbow coalition needs you, we need you, and we send you our love. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, three more awards left. Uh, the next award is for our own Ismail Mohammed, that the bogus Egyptian government prevented from coming to this country. But we will not forget his work, and we will continue to fight alongside him and for him and make sure that he has freedom of movement, that he is no longer persecuted. And we stand with you, Ismail, always and forever. And I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask our own Imad Habibedin uh, to accept the award on Ismail's behalf. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mohammed Ismail was the first person or one of the first people in Egypt to come out um, up as openly atheists and um, atheists in Egypt has been facing a horrible, horrible um, uh, crackdown which unfortunately we see, we've seen the Coptic Church teaming up with Muslim fundamentalists in all sorts of events, you know, um, uh, warning people from the dangers of drugs, prostitution and atheism. Um, I think it's, it, it was such an important um, step when Ismail Muhammad and many other Egyptians came out um, to speak openly about atheism and uh, facing all the dangers. Ismail Muhammad had to change many times where he lived and he had to quit many jobs in order to keep, um, you know, keep the fight alive. And we are always in debt to people in Islamic countries who still keep fight for, you know, uh, one day, a secular Middle East and North Africa and South Asia where everybody is, um, where nobody is discriminated because of their religious belief or sexual orientation or political ideas. Thank you. Our next winner is someone you were blown away with at this very conference, though we were blown away by lots of people, but especially this wonderful man from Jordan who is so brave and courageous. And we love you, Mohammed al Khedra. We love you. <laughs> Hi again. <laughs> so you make me speak twice in the same day. <laughs> and I've been 25 years of not doing that. <laughs> okay. So I just want one thing from all of you. That I know that we won't let you down, the ones on the front lines. Just you don't let yourselves down and don't let us down. If we can reach a point where we are all a single unit. We can all work together and we can all stand together. But I have something that I didn't face 
physical harm to myself or to my family because of religion. And I find that uh, this gift or this prize is actually, I, I know someone who deserves it the most and you deserve it. You should have it. And last but not least, the greatest man ever, who is to blame for actually ex-Muslims becoming ex-Muslims. Everybody you meet, what happened? We read the God delusion, and that was it. To the ever brilliant, the wonderful Richard Dawkins. Well, you might have given me some warning of this. <laughs> like Anthony Grayling, I feel humbled to be in such company. I wasn't expecting this. Um, we in this country and in America are spoiled brats by comparison with the people in this room's world. You are in the front line trench. You are the ones who bear the danger and the, 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 the peril and the heartache uh, which religion can bring. We have it relatively easy. And you get it not only from the Islamic world itself, but you get it from those people in my world who ought to be your natural allies. I refer to the regressive liberal left. It's a kind of et tu brute moment. So I feel we're fighting on two fronts. We're fighting on the obvious enemies and we're fighting on those who ought to be our friends. I'm honored and privileged to have been at this conference among such people, and I'm honored and privileged to receive this award. Thank you very much indeed. Just before we um, enjoy some music, um, could everybody put their hands together for the wonderful Miriam for everything she's done? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sadia, Mariam, and Imad. And thank you all and the recipients of uh, awards from Council of Ex-Muslim Britain. <laughs>